Welcome back to my channel, Roses. I am Avarice Rose, and today we are going to be diving into episode two of the Haunted Castle series, focusing in on castles of England. So if you're new here, or if you have been waiting for me to start creating content again, please feel free to click the subscribe button, like this video, leave a comment below, and ding the bell so you get notifications. YouTube's kind of bad about notifications, so just keep an eye out on this channel for when I upload next because not everybody gets their notifications even if they have tagged the bell on. So without further ado, let's get into this. Grab a snack, something to drink, and enjoy this episode two of Haunted Castles of England. So again today, we are going to be looking at three castles that are haunted, supposedly, allegedly, in England. The first being Hever Castle and Gardens. When it comes to Hever Castle, the original medieval defensive castle with its gatehouse and bailey was built in 1270, and in the 15th and 16th centuries, it was home to one of the most powerful families in Britain, the Boleyns who added the Tudor aspects to the home. The castle became the childhood home of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife. <laughs> Had to do some counting there. Um, she became Queen of England for just 1,000 days before she was beheaded. And it was because of his love for Anne that King Henry VIII divorced his first wife, the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon. Um, yes, his brothers dead brother's widow and renounced Catholicism and created the Church of England that they still have today. Hever later passed into the ownership of another one of Henry's wives slash ex-wives um, who survived, Anne of Cleves. So she was so she was a German princess. And from 1557 onward, it was owned by a number of different families. Gradually, Hever did fall into decline until William Waldorf Astor invested time, money, and passion into restoring the castle. He commissioned the Tudor village, now called the Astor Wing, and constructed the magnificent gardens and lakes, which includes a really, really pretty Italian garden. So with 700 years of history, of course, ghosts and supernatural happenings go on in Hever Castle. At Hever, these include a man in a bowler hat, seen heading into the cellar and a Tudor gentleman who inhabits a chair in one corner of Henry's bedroom. And I'm assuming when they say Henry, they mean Henry VIII, possibly. He has been seen numerous times to children and also by one visitor who asked the staff why they had bought such an unrealistic hologram when it was actually a ghost. But the most notorious ghost of Hever is the most tragic, and that is, of course, of the fallen Queen Anne or Anne Boleyn. Sightings of Anne's ghosts are said to occur around Christmas time, and this is thought to be because Christmas was supposedly her favorite time of year, and Hever Castle was where she grew up. There's a large oak tree on the grounds of the castle where Henry VIII and Anne are said to have spent a number of hours courting, and Anne's ghost has been seen underneath that tree on many occasions. Her ghostly figure has also been seen walking around the bridge over Eden Lake. Now, Anne is said to be one of the most well-traveled ghosts of Britain. People see her ghost everywhere from Hever Castle to Hampton Court Palace to the Tower of London. Um, and sometimes people see her like she was in life, young, vibrant, and beautiful and happy, while other unfortunate people see her headless with her head tucked under her arm because she was beheaded by a French executioner. Something really interesting that I found um, on one of the websites when I was researching was an account in 1976. A man named C.W. Bamford contacted Lord Astor proclaiming his connection with Anne Boleyn, whose name was formerly uh, Bullen, like B-U-L-L-O-N. And what followed were a series of peculiar letters, meetings, and encounters. And this is quoted directly from this link that is down below. 
Bamford's grandfather, H. Bullen of Cromer, spent a considerable amount of time trying to trace his ancestry. He had a theory that he was in some way connected with the Bullen family of Sally, the origin of Anne's grandfather. Whenever possible, Bamford and his grandfather would pursue their quest with the most remarkable result. Bamford noted that all of my grandfather's predecessors back to the early 1700s all came from within 15 miles of Sally. Bamford became convinced by his own connections, by an inner interest and instinct that could not be explained or understood. He began visiting sites known to have been frequented by Anne in an effort to establish some form of contact with the past. Lord Astor was intrigued by Bamford's letter, admitting that, I seem to have indulged in the same sort of pleasures of the interests as you have been trying to gain personal experiences of the environments in which my ancestors moved. As such, Bamford felt it necessary to visit Hever Castle in an attempt to make contact with Anne Boleyn's ghostly vibrations. So he's coming to actually like visit Hever to try and connect with Anne's ghost. On one visit to the castle, Bamford suggested that the guidebook which depicted Anne witnessing her father greet King Henry from a first floor window was wrong. He later stood in a certain spot overlooking the courtyard and felt certain that this is where Anne Boleyn had stood. In Anne Boleyn's bedroom, he's quoted to have said, For some reason, I remained on a step just below the small window with my hands on the window sill. I received impressions generated by considerable force. These impressions were of a young woman, some 25 or 26 years of age, in some distress. Fists beating on the windowsill, scrabbling of fingernails on the surrounding walls. I can definitely draw Anne's spirit within reach. Creepy. Lord Astor was not so favorable, obviously, of Bamford's more vivid impressions, but could Anne's ghost have been trying to make contact with who may be her present-day ancestor? One will never know. Or was this just somebody really reaching? Who knows? Tuppery Castle was built in 1071, following the Norman invasion of 1066 as a reminder of the new rulers. Built on the site of an old Anglo-Saxon fort, it was originally a timber moat and bailey castle. So it was made of wood. It was given to one of William the Conqueror's soldiers, Henry de Ferrers, as reward for his loyalty, and it stayed in the hands of the de Ferrers family who later were awarded the title of Earl of Derby, or Darby, depending on how you pronounce it. It sits on a hill overlooking the twisty river Dove and has great views over the hills of Derbyshire, if you can make it up the tower's tiny steps to have a look. It's ruins now, but there was still enough left of the building for a day out, so a lot of schools go to trips there, and over the last um, few years or so, it's become a popular site for weddings, including having, you know, get gatherings and get-togethers or receptions in the Great Hall. Famous visitors include Henry VIII, Queen Isabella, but the castle is most famous for being one of the prisons of Mary, Queen of Scots. She was imprisoned by Queen Elizabeth I four times, and it is thought that Tutbury was where she planned to overthrow Elizabeth, and that was the plot that eventually was discovered and led to her eventual execution. So even though Tutbury is now majority ruins, there are still ghost sightings that happen in this castle. Mary is one of the most seen ghosts at Tutbury. According to the castle website, she was seen all in white by some members of Her Majesty's services. In 2004, at approximately midnight, she was seen standing at the top of the South Tower by over 40 men, in the form of a figure dressed in a pure white gown. When they saw her, they all just laughed, believing the curator was teasing them by putting on an Elizabethan gown as a joke. When it was pointed out that the curator, Leslie Smith, does not have a white dress, and neither do any other Elizabethan reenactors who work at the castle, the men were profoundly disturbed by this sighting, a particularly important sighting as there were so many who saw her. She was also seen rapidly crossing the grass one hot afternoon in 1984 by a serving Marine. There is also a ghost known as the Keeper at Tutbury. It is said that he steps out in John of Gaunt's gateway and shouts, get thee hence. He wears a full suit of armor too, 
Some have suggested that the Keeper is a reenactor, but he has appeared on days when the reenactors aren't on duty. There was even a shadow of what looked like an armored man caught on film when most haunted television series was making a program there. The shadow actually turned and looked at the camera. Warwick Castle's history starts over 1100 years ago when Danish invaders began moving in on Saxon lands from the north. The Saxon army was led by the oldest daughter of King Alfred the Great, a warrior princess named Athelflaed. In 1910 AD, she ordered the building of a borough, or a fortified earthen rampart to protect the town of Warwick. The first castle appeared on this site thanks to another invader, William the Conqueror. After his victory over King Harold at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, William needed to consolidate his power in England. So in 1068, he ordered the building of a wooden moat and bailey in the Midlands as a means of holding the area and securing lines of supply. William entrusted the construction of Warwick Castle to Henry de Newborough, who later became the first Earl of Warwick in 1088. Warwick Castle was associated with various historic events, including the Norman Conquest of England, Hundred Years' Wars between England and France, and the War of the Roses. Following the War of the Roses, though, a peaceful existence actually began at Warwick Castle. Under the Toussaint's group, which were absorbed into Merlin Entertainment in 2007, Warwick Castle has undergone millions of pounds of restoration works to maintain the castle's glorious past and ensure, through continued research and conservation, that the castle will continue to stand as Britain's ultimate castle. So they have done a lot of work and poured a lot of money into Warwick Castle to keep it um, as close to the times as they possibly can with making the necessary, you know, reinforcements and also updates as needed, such as wiring or indoor plumbing. So again, a castle steeped in history, torture and punishment, and of course war, Warwick Castle is unsurprisingly one of the most haunted places in England. Among its most frequent paranormal sightings is the ghostly figure of a black dog, said to have been cursed on the castle by Ma Bloxham, a woman punished for stealing. According to legend, shortly after Bloxham disappeared, a slavering dog with red evil eyes began stalking the grounds and terrorizing its inhabitants. While the mutt was eventually killed, his ghostly form continues to stalk visitors to this day. So supposedly it was an actual real dog that was killed and now it's seen around the castle. Another famous ghost is that of Sir Falk Greville, who was brutally stabbed by his servant Ralph Haywood, who then turned the knife on himself. Moans are often heard in the South Tower where Greville died and people have claimed to have witnessed the figure of a man emerging from his portrait. So there was actually a Victorian ghost transcript found in Warwick Castle's archive. And I have the link down below in the description so that you can go and read the entire transcripts. So according to this article that I found, which is super cool, an eerie Victorian transcript of a seance has been uncovered in Warwick Castle's archive held at Warwickshire County Records Office. This rare and ghostly document was found in a sealed envelope stuffed in between bundles of receipts and bills belonging to Anne Greville. She lived from 1829 to 1903 and was the fourth Countess of Warwick. Anne's papers, which have been in the care of the County Records Office since 1978, have never been thoroughly examined since her death in 1903. So they have been under lock and key for a really, really long time. The two documents detail conversations the Victorian Countess had with ghosts who she believed who have inhabited her home, Warwick Castle. At the center of the seance is a spirit identified as a former servant, Edward Jameson, who claims to have stolen some item from the family and hidden it in a room of the castle. One of the papers, which is written using the so-called spirit or automatic writing technique, begins with the unsettling sentences, leave all to future research. The power at work is not that of the mortals in the castle of here. The spirit of me called Edward Jameson is one of these who now haunt the place. Documents make clear that Anne was disturbed by the noises she was hearing in the castle. The seances she held, probably some point during the 1870s or 80s, were an attempt to refrain these spirits from bothering her family. The conversations with the ghosts and a medium 
seemingly held in various domestic rooms that are now offices belonging to the general manager, came to an alarming abrupt end in the transcript for unknown reasons. I'm gonna butcher this name, just FYI, but Adam Busikayowicz, a PhD student from Warwick University who was researching Anne's life and artistic achievements said, I have read from other sources that Anne was interested in ghosts, but I have never come across a document quite like this before. It is obvious from the way that it was hidden in a sealed envelope that it wasn't meant to be found. They are very rare and intriguing. Benjamin Earl, the web editor for our Warwickshire website said, he was delighted when Adam shared this with them, um, shared the story of finding the Victorian letter and his findings. The story is one that can't fail to absorb some mysterious documents, an ancient castle, strange noises, and a secret waiting to be given up. The sharing of histories and stories such as this is exactly what our Warwickshire is about as it enables people to engage with the past, other people, and find out new things. It shows that history in Warwickshire County Record Office never ceases to surprise in what it turns up. And the full transcript and image of these ghostly letters have been uploaded to the link in the description down below and they're free and accessible for all to read. And they're very interesting, really strange. Yeah, I personally don't think that the activity got any better after she did this, I kind of think the letters might have abruptly stopped um, because it actually made it worse. So. so that is all I have for you again today, guys. I hope you enjoy learning about the history of these castles and their famous haunts. If you like this kind of stuff, leave a comment down below, like this video, share it with your friends um, because you are getting history along with some spooky stories. And the next video I am super, super, super excited about Episode three is most likely going to be one castle on its own, and it's a pretty famous one, and there's a few I'm debating between, so we'll see who it is or what it is or who shows up. And again, I do plan on doing a Haunted Castle series of the rest of the British Isles and Ireland as well as Europe, and maybe even most likely branching into Haunted America as well. So be well, stay inside, stay safe, and stay sane. One love, guys.